So here was the question that I ended the last part of this video with, and all you need to do is multiply a bunch of things together. The average power is going to be the flux density of the sunlight times the area of the photovoltaics, and then that further has to be multiplied by the capacity factor and the efficiency. So overall that's 1000 watts per square meter times 10 to the 4 meters squared times the 25% and the 20%, and that comes out to about 0.5 megawatts, which is a very small power generation facility indeed. Let's now talk about payback times. There are two distinct payback times to talk about. With any energy technology, at the point that we build and install it, there is some energy expenditure required in the construction and installation, and similarly it costs some money. Now this is true for any energy technology, but because the payback times for photovoltaics have historically been rather long, they tend to be discussed more than other energy sources. So we build and install and pay some energy and money, and then you gradually make that back. And the payback time is the point at which you break even, which for modern photovoltaics seems to be in the 1 to 4 year range, which is not too bad because they have lifetimes in the 15 to 20 year range. The monetary payback time is very complicated. A recent study in Australia found residential payback times of 5 to 15 years. That enormous range shows you just how complicated this can be. The payback times for solar power will of course depend on the solar power availability at a given location. And so let's get a simple estimate, it'll be a gross over estimate, of the maximum yearly power availability at any location. So we'll start with the flux density, which for the sun directly overhead in dry air we've seen is about a thousand watts per meter squared. And to get the energy available per year per meter squared, we just multiply that by a year. And let's do the simplest thing we possibly could and say multiply by a half for daytime only. That gives us a figure of about 4,400 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Let's compare that with actual availability, and as this map shows, the peak values are somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,500 kilowatt hours per meter squared, so somewhat more than half of what we calculated. But remember, what we calculated assumed the sun is directly overhead all the time. Even in a tropical location with dry air, for the hour or so, say, after sunrise or before sunset, the actual available power is similar to noon near the Arctic Circle, because the sun is very low in the sky. Also, notice that the best availability is typically not on the equator. That might be counterintuitive, but remember dry air and little cloud is very important, and so unsurprisingly the highest availabilities are in desert locations, which are mostly in the subtropics. Looking in more detail at North America and thinking about Canada, note that about the best availabilities in Canada, which are out in the prairies, is about half the availability of a subtropical desert, but that there are regions of pretty good availability extending surprisingly north, again because of how important it is to have dry air and little cloud. Most of those considerations, like availability and so on, are roughly the same for concentrated solar power versus photovoltaics, but there are some important differences, especially around efficiency, so let's have a closer look at concentrated solar power. In this picture, this is one particular setup for concentrated solar power. We have pipes with fluid flowing through them, and we have parabolic mirrors reflecting sunlight onto them to heat up that fluid. That fluid is then used as the hot reservoir for a heat engine. Another type is a tower, where instead of the fluid flowing through pipes in the middle of mirrors, we have arrays of mirrors that reflect up to a tower, and again that tower has fluid flowing through it and will again run a heat engine. There are many, many possible setups for concentrated solar power, but more or less they all share this feature that mirrors are being used to reflect light and concentrate it onto a fluid to heat it up. And from that point on, it's a heat engine, and so it's a thermal power plant just like a fossil fuel powered plant, except instead of burning something in a furnace to convert chemical energy into thermal energy, we're converting light energy into thermal energy.
One thing that goes along with all of that is that the efficiency works out the same way it does for other thermal power plants, although the temperatures achieved are not always as high as they are, say, in gas-fired plants. But now we come to a huge advantage that concentrated solar power has. That heated fluid can be stored in insulated tanks, and so this makes concentrated solar power what is called dispatchable. Anytime you have a power source where, when the production is larger than the demand, you can store the excess, and then later on, when demand is larger than what's being produced, you can draw from your storage, this is referred to as a dispatchable supply. Concentrated solar power, because you can store the fluid, is dispatchable. And this is a huge advantage, because renewable sources that are dispatchable are relatively rare. Now, I just said that renewable sources that are dispatchable are rare, but in fact we can make any energy production facility dispatchable if we just include large enough battery storage at the facility. That's how you would do it, say, for a photovoltaic facility. But a concentrated solar power facility is done differently. You can do it by using insulated storage tanks. So which of these is likely more efficient? Let's compare the photovoltaics with batteries with a solar power facility with storage tanks. And this is a terrible assumption, but let's suppose that the efficiencies are the same. Now, in fact, the CSP typically would have a higher efficiency of power production than the solar panels. But to compare apples and apples, let's assume that the solar panels are as efficient as the heat engine in the CSP plant, so that any difference in efficiency is coming from the storage method. 